Shalom and uh, welcome to today's Middle East Report. In this programme today, we'll be discussing how one NGO is making a big difference in Israel and strengthening the body of Messiah in the nation of Israel. Warm welcome to the program. And uh, today's guest is all the way from Israel, and he needs no introduction. Uh, this is uh, Barry Siegel, the co founder and director of Vision for Israel and Joseph Storehouse. And you're about to celebrate your 25th anniversary as an NGO. Warm welcome to the Middle East, Port Barry. Thank you so much. Shalom. It's great to be here back in the United Kingdom. Excellent. Uh, and Barry, I've always wanted to know your testimony of, of how you came to faith in Yeshua HaMashiach, how your incredible organization that you run, uh, Vision for Israel, also known in the UK as Joseph Storehouse, how that was launched, uh, and the incredible humanitarian work that you're doing in Israel, encouraging Christians to bless Israel and stand with the Jewish people. Absolutely remarkable. We probably need about uh, six or seven programs, but we'll try and consolidate it into a short that, period. You. you know, probably like most, um, you know, average, I'd say, in the generation that I grew up in, uh, I was born in the United States. And so I grew up in a very traditional, uh, I'd say kind of average Jewish home in the suburbs of what is known as Motown the uh, soul music capital of uh, the United States, certainly in the 50s, 60s, somewhat the 70s. And um, I grew up in a suburb with my parents, my brothers in that area. And um, I can't really say that there were any dynamic milestones in my life, except for one that I remember. I was around five or six years old, and there was a movie that came out with Charlton Heston called Ben-Hur. Oh, yes, yeah. And um, I'll never forget that I was sitting next to my father, and it was in those days on these big screens. And uh, this was in a theater in Detroit. And uh, I'll never forget an image uh, stamped into my mind, and most likely my heart, too, when uh, Ben-Hur's uh, sister, I believe it was, and uh, his mother, or his um, a lady he was close to, and his mother both had uh, uh, become lepers, and they were put into a leper colony. The Romans had put them there, kind of like an imprisonment, um, that when uh, Jesus is lifted uh, up on the cross in the end, and the blood is running down, and the rain, and the storms, and the cracking of the sky opening up, they were suddenly healed as they looked upon uh, Yeshua at the cross, and they were healed of their leprosy, and for some reason that image stayed with me. Um, but having grown up as a Jew, I was not exposed I would say, to that much in the way of Christianity and the understanding of uh, many Jewish people growing up, uh, certainly being the son of a high-ranking officer in World War II. My father fought in five major battles in World War II, including the Battle of the Bulge and D-Day, wow. and um, came out unscathed, which is a miracle in itself. And um, But somehow, you know, our understanding of Christians were that they were, for the most part, had a history of anti-Semitism against the Jewish people for about 19 centuries, 18, 19 centuries. So up until my bar mitzvah, really, that was probably my understanding, but without any kind of uh, prejudice, you know, uh, you know, it wasn't anything I really gave thought to. I was just a little kid growing up in the in Detroit area at that time. Uh, later we would move, and I moved from the home of soul music to the city of rock and roll, which was known as Cleveland, Ohio at that time. But when I was bar mitzvahed, um, 
I think one of the things uh, was key for me was that I understood uh, having a grandfather who was president of the synagogue and also by this time I'd already been playing guitar from the age of 10. Um, I kind of knew that if I gave a great performance for my family in the synagogue, I would reap the benefits financially of the gifts that came in. Now a bar mitzvah, as you know, is a son being confirmed under the law of Moses. And 13 is the age at which, you know, you go from being a boy to manhood in Judaism. So I really gave it all I could. I trained under the uh, rabbi and the cantor, which is the worship leader of the synagogue. And I literally learned how to sing according to the Torah, the scriptures, with the musical accents uh, all the way through my bar mitzvah portion. And I was determined that one way I'm going to go out and prove I'm a man is I'm going to go out and I'm going to buy my first electric guitar and a big amplifier. And I'm going to become a Jewish rock and roll musician. <laughs> So I went from this transition of playing in the, as a young soprano voice in school, the part of Oliver Twist in the musical Oliver, where I had to learn to have a slight British accent, uh, and singing boys soprano, like out of the, something out of the Vienna Boys Choir or something, to suddenly uh, deciding my aim was to become a rock and roll musician. So by the age of 14, my hair was down past my shoulders. I auditioned for one of the garage bands, as you, we would call things now, um, in the community where I lived and I was going to school at the time. And uh, every day after school, we went and practiced. Uh, we were the long hair group that was unorthodox. We were a group of rebels, you could say, revolutionary rebels that turned over the dress code in school experimented with uh, alternative uh, lifestyles. And um, so I got more and more into it. Our band be was becoming popular on weekends. We traveled anywhere from Pittsburgh to Detroit, playing in concerts. And uh, we became a quite popular local band at the time and kind of the high school uh, battle of the bands winner. So that was kind of my teenage years. I went from being this kind of very conservative, traditional Jewish boy, being bar mitzvahed, and then going out to the world and becoming what I would say in a nutshell to save on time was a left-wing, radical, progressive, Marxist, atheist, hippie, yippie, pot-smoking <laughs> Jewish rock and roll guitar player for a rock and roll band. That's my testimony in a nutshell. But at the age of 15, all this would change, for I went to a rock concert, and after the concert, I was sitting right below the feet of a very well-known rhythm and blues guitarist who was with a band out in California in those days, and I made like a beeline for him, and when he stood up on that stage with his long black hair, his long flowing beard, and a beautiful electric guitar over his shoulders, he looked kind of the way Jesus would look like playing the electric guitar. And I handed him a bag of marijuana cigarettes, joints, and I said, you just inspired me incredibly so with your music, with your guitar playing. And so I just wanted to give you this bag of marijuana to thank you. And he turned around and he looked me straight in the eyes and he said, no man, Jesus is the only answer. Well, Simon, I never heard those words before. And I didn't even know what he was talking about. And more than that, I thought, but wait a minute, all these rock musicians and hippies and all that, they all, you know, do some kinds of drugs or drinking or alternative lifestyle. So I was shocked standing there with this bag and I didn't know what to do. So I went to the drummer and he gladly took it. But this same guitar player, one year later, leaves the band he's playing with in California, they're well known, and he comes to live in the city where I live at, at the time, in Cleveland, Ohio, and he's auditioning guys who want to become top rock musicians in performance, and I become one of his students. And so for the next six months before he would go on to play with a gospel band, I was his student. I was his disciple. And it was like every song he would teach me or sing would be something about his testimony, something about Jesus, or some hymn that he souped up to rock and roll, rhythm and blues styled music. 
and it's like this little red devil would come out on my left shoulder with a pitchfork going, you must be the craziest Jew paying him all this money just to hear this stuff. And an angel would come flying in on my right shoulder with a gold sash and a harp going, but he's so good, isn't he? And I said, yeah, he is, you know? So I stuck it out with him, but he was really a, a master of the guitar. And I really respected him for it. But after he went on to his own, I got more and more into the rock and roll scene, more and more into the alternative culture that I was living at that time, even though I was still in school. But uh, finally, all this culminated in uh, 1971, believe it or not. I don't look that old, but I am. <laughs> and I was born. one night I was leaving a Jewish delicatessen, you know, where you get a good salt beef sandwich with Thousand Island dressing and Swiss cheese. It's not kosher, but it's really tasty. And as I got to the backside of the deli, heading home, I was in my right mind. I was going home to play the guitar and uh, to practice late at night, as I usually did. And as I got to the backside of the deli, there was this kind of eerie, this darkness that f f fell all around me. And it's as if somebody bumped into me as I was walking in the direction towards home. And the food I had fell onto the ground. And I had an instant flash um, of my life going in front of me. And because I had almost been killed twice, once in a car accident and once in a drowning, suddenly this, this feeling of not knowing why I was born and what would happen if I died tomorrow, where would I be? What would happen in my life? And I didn't understand it. And I had not, I hadn't been to a church and I, I didn't understand Christianity per se. But all of a sudden, this heaviness fell over me, and I knew I was in the presence of someone else that I couldn't see. I just knew somebody was there next to me, and I began to weep, and I fell to my knees on this street corner at around 11 o'clock at night. And all of a sudden, as I'm weeping, an audible voice speaks to me three times, says these exact words in English, Barry, you should have more faith than this. Three times audibly, not with inside, but from outside of me. And I knew instantly, I don't know how to explain it. I didn't know how to explain it as a Jew, but instantly I knew that Yeshua, in Hebrew we call him, which means salvation, or Jesus in English, is the Jewish Messiah. I instantly knew it. And all I could say is once I was blind, but suddenly I saw. And I cried out to God. And I was an atheist. I didn't even believe in God. But I cried out to him and I said, Lord, I said, I, I, do, I don't know what to do. I'll do anything you want me to do. And it was like out of Oliver Twist, anything. I said, I'll quit school if I have to. But that was easy because I hardly showed up for school. <laughs> I said, I'll stop smoking pot and doing this, that, and the other. I'll do whatever it takes. But the one thing I know that after 20 minutes of weeping and, and intercommunicating with God from my heart and verbally with my mouth, I knew he wanted me to give up music and to give him back everything. And when I said, God, if I never pick up the guitar again, I belong to you. And when I said those words, it's as if satanic chains fell off my back. And um, it was a process, uh, but I knew something happened to me that night that would, was as great as the day I was born. Absolutely incredible. Inspirational, Barry. Thank you. I, I never knew that, so thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, and um, when did the Lord put his on your heart? Well, it wasn't long afterwards, actually. And um, shortly thereafter, and I graduated from American High School at the time, um, uh, uh, I moved down with my mother to Miami Beach. And uh, I was just consuming the Word of God. I got a job. I quit the band I was in um, before it would have killed me or diverted me from my newfound faith. Um, but while I was down there at night, uh, you know, in Miami, there'd be this nice moonlight that I'd go out. And because I couldn't do this around my mother or grandmother, I felt like Timothy at the time, actually, because I had just Shortly after I became a believer, I met a Bible teacher named Derek Prince, wow. who had a passionate love for Israel. 
And I met him only about three, four months after this experience that I had at a businessman's meeting for Christians. But I still had long hair. I took off the red headband for my Marxism. I was still wearing my Levi blue jeans because I am a Levite anyways. And um, I connected with Derek uh, at that meeting where he laid hands on me and prayed for me. And then I would later connect with him down in South Florida where he and Lydia Prince were living. Mm -hmm. And they had a Bible study for young people. So I ended up going to that Bible study. So between going to that Bible study and consuming, literally eating the Word of God every night, I'd read like 10, 20 chapters at a time. I decided, Simon, as a Jew, it was my responsibility to read from the beginning of Genesis all the way through to the end of scriptures. And um, I had had a lot of resistance. My, uh, one of my grandparents had arranged to try and deprogram me and sent a rabbi to try and convince me otherwise. And all I could tell this rabbi was, um, look, all I can tell you is when the audible voice of God speaks to you, you have to obey. And I, there was just nothing more I could say. Once I was blind, but now I see. And I didn't understand all the reasons why he felt threatened as a Jewish rabbi, but I dedicated myself to study the Word of God, but to also go into my past history as a Jew and study the history of the Jewish people, as well as what my father witnessed and my 25% of my family suffered through in the Holocaust, losing their own lives in the extermination camps, I dedicated myself not only as a Jew, but as a born-again Jew by the Spirit of God. And not long after that, I would actually go to a Jewish college for a couple years to increase my education as a Jew, but also to be a better witness for the kingdom of God. But when I really knew that I was called to move to Israel was while I was praying out in the sand dunes of a construction site in Miami Beach, I came across this scripture for the first time of my life in the prophet Zechariah. And here's what it says. Um, it says in Zechariah 8, verses 7 and 8, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will save my people from the land of the east and from the land of the west. Well, I said, if you look geographically west of Jerusalem and you go around the earth, you come to Miami Beach, Florida, where I was living after I had graduated from school. And so I said, okay, God saved me in the land of the west. Verse 8, I will bring them back and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem they shall be my people and I will be their God in truth and righteousness. And from that day forward, it wasn't God speaking to me in an audible voice, but through the written word of the prophets in scripture itself, in the Tanakh. And, and so, or what in Hebrew we call the Tanakh and, and most people would know as the Bible. So from that day forward, the lights flashed and I knew as a Jewish believer in Yeshua the Messiah, and as a, as a member of the tribe of the Levites, which I am literally, I knew my calling was to go back to the city of Jerusalem and to make Aliyah or immigrate to the land of Israel, which I ultimately did in 1981. Incredible. And, and you are literally the ultimate Israeli citizen, having served in the IDF. And you told me before the program that you're part of the uh, Galani Brigade, which is a very prestigious unit in the IDF. Yes, I had the privilege of being a new immigrant who was inducted uh, mandatory in, into the IDF. And I did my basic training um, down in the south of Israel and then would later be transferred to a Golani unit in the north of Israel. And uh, I would, uh, <clears throat> interesting between that, during those years, of course, I met Batia, my wife. I actually met her at a Bible study for musicians and songwriters, of which she was one of the foremost pioneers of Messianic praise and worship music in Israel. And uh, even before we were married, we teamed up. She was looking for a guitar player or a keyboard player to accompany her with the song she was writing, especially at music conferences, and I was a lone soldier looking for a good uh, meal somewhere. <laughs> Fabulous. Um, uh, just absolutely inspirational story. So I'm, I'm sure that you've encouraged so many of our viewers with that very, very powerful testimony. Uh, uh, Barry, but how did um, uh, Vision for Israel start, or was known in, um, in England as Joseph Storehouse? 
Well, ultimately, Bhakti and I not only teamed up in music, but of course, we eventually knew we were called to be husband and wife. And uh, for the first several years, really, Bhakti and I had kind of a uh, kind of a two-tiered uh, ministry as husband and wife. One was uh, I owned and pioneered two businesses, uh, Israeli small businesses in Israel, one which was in graphics and printing services and translation and publishing and typesetting, and the other was a tourism store that reached out to Christian tour groups, and we had Judaica, we had our CDs, the couple that we had at the time, one of which was well-known called Shema Yisrael, which is still our number one selling CD or online it's available. Uh, Shema Yisrael, uh, that was produced together with a local British uh, well-known uh, songwriter producer named Martin Smith, a delirious. And uh, we've now done about seven albums, Bhatti and I, together. Um, but um, we were business people. But along with that, we wore another hat. We were uh, founders. I was the senior uh, messianic leader of a local Jerusalem congregation back in the mid-'80s to the mid-'90s. And um, it was during that time that uh, as we were traveling also uh, for praise and worship, we were doing a lot of events, not just for the body of Christ or the body of Messiah in Israel and globally, but uh, we were getting asked by some agencies in Israel to reach out to Jewish communities across Russia to represent Israel in some cultural events that we did in China, in India, in Russia, in uh, the Ukraine, in the United States, in Spain. We were with the former president of Israel, uh, who's since passed on, President Navone. We did a 500-year anniversary of the Inquisition in Spain. We did the praise and worship music there. And, um, and so, because it was attended by many evangelical Christians. So that was kind of our two-tiered approach. But in 1993, God gave me a specific word about the life of Joseph uh, from the chapters in the book of Genesis and how uh, at the same time in 1993, September 13th, 1993, Israel signed the Oslo Peace Accords between uh, former Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, who was later assassinated, and um, Anwar Sadat, and of course on the White House lawn when President um, Clinton was in office office at the time. And here, you know, there was this new urgency for peace and Yasser Arafat, this reformed quote unquote terrorist. And it looked like the uh, gang of four were about because Shimon Peres was there, also the foreign minister of Israel at the time. And now we were going to usher in a new era of peace. But something in our hearts, Bati is in my heart and in the hearts of many local messianic believers in Israel felt very awkward that this wasn't going to lead to an era of peace, but it was going to actually open the doors to a Pandora box of terror. And so I was really, we were interceding, we were praying, Simon, we were calling out on the name of the Lord, God spare us, you know, from what this pending disaster is going to bring upon Israel about returning Judea and Samaria, uh, you know, just didn't know where this was going to lead to. And as I was taking a shower one day, believe it or not, the Holy Spirit does speak in the shower or <laughs> while we're driving in the car, I heard these words, God is in control. And I thought like it was the Lord in the midst of my anguish and my prayers because I'm an ardent, committed uh, Israeli citizen now, not just an American citizen, but an Israeli citizen, one who served in the IDF and the reserves for 13 years. I, I just felt in my spirit, you know, I love this land, I love this people. The day I made Aliyah to Israel, I kissed the ground. I knew I was home. I knew that, th that uh, this is the home of the Jewish people that Jews are coming back from the east, the west, the north, and the south. That's what the prophets prophesied. That's what I, as a person 
person as a Jew and as a born-again Jewish believer fulfilled. And so I'm very committed to the land of Israel and the future of its people. And so when God spoke to me, those words kind of deepened my spirit, not audibly, but I, I knew with inside that God is in control, not to worry about the Oslo Peace Accords. God is the God of history. It's his story, as we've heard so yes, often absolutely. said. And then suddenly I, I, I understood the, this, the scriptures of Joseph interpreting the vision and the dreams that Pharaoh had, that there would be seven years of uh, plenty followed by seven years of famine. And I knew that these Oslo Peace Accords suddenly would be the seven years of plenty. And, and I felt like the Lord spoke to me prophetically and said, I will there will be seven years of relative peace and prosperity through these peace accords. But after seven years, these accords will collapse and fail. And from then on, I will shake the nations until the time of the Messiah's return. And literally, that's what happened. Um, not seven and seven, but seven years. There was a boom, the internet boom, a financial boom. And then seven years later to the month, Yasser Arafat, Yasser Arafat literally closed the door on the Oslo Peace Accords, and, and during that time, the reign of terror was, was suicide bombers and just unrelenting against the people of Israel. And, um, yeah, I mean, that was uh, quite extraordinary because... And then Vision for Israel and the Joseph Storehouse was born in 1994. Amazing. That's quite incredible. So actually, know that seven-year period, literally almost uh, seven years, because Arafat walked away from the Camp David Peace Accords back in August of 2000 and uh, launched a horrific intifada against yeah. uh, Israel with daily suicide bombings, bus bombings. I mean, being in Jerusalem at that time, people were fearful of going down the streets in, in case they were. Well, we were. Our daughter had four of her friends four of our daughter's friends, three from school, the same high school class, they went to high school together, and one who was together with her in the military, all four of them were murdered by Hamas suicide, homicide bombers in 1996. And because our NGO, Vision for Israel, and the Joseph Storehouse were founded in 1994, this would change our lives. We closed our business entity, and we began to do as much as we could for the victims of terror attacks, of which we do have a video that shows that. Let's have a look now at this uh, excellent video uh, produced by Vision for Israel that looks and shows how um, Joseph Storehouse is really reaching out to the victims of terrorism, and uh, this is one particular story. עד היום זה רודף אותי. עד היום אני יודעת שיכלתי להיות במקום יותר טוב, במקום אחר. הייתי ממש צעירה. ביום הזה, יום שישי, זה שלוקח אותי, החליט שהוא נוסע לאשדוד, והוא עצר לי בצומת משטרה. ישבו שם שני גברים באוטו. כשהם עשו פרסה, אמרתי, מה, הם דפוקים? איך הם נכנסים באין כניס... זה לא לאוטו פרטי, זה יותר לאוטובוס ומוניות. ופתאום... אחרי הפיגוע הלכתי לבקר אותה, היא לא זיהתה אותי אפילו. לא אותי, לא את המשפחה שלה, את האבא שלה, שהיא דחפה אותו אפילו. נורא קשה לי עם זה, לא קל לי. תמיד אמרתי, יואו, איך אנשים מגזימים, איך אנשים, זה כמו לראות סרט אימה, או איך אנשים מקצינים, אבל כשזה מגיע לבן אדם... זה לא אביבה שהכרתי. עד שהיא עברה כמה טיפולים. והרבה דברים, ממש עזרה מהמשפחה, מאימא שלה, ותמיכה, והכול, עד שהיא חזרה טיפה לעצמה, זה עד היום רודף אותה. זה בא לי בחלומות, זה, זה בא לי שהייתי גם לא חולמת וכמה עם זיעה. היא לא הייתה יכולה לדעת לאוטובוסים, פחד במקלחת, חדשות אני לא יכול לראות, כי זה מזכיר לה כל מיני דברים, סרטים אני לא יכול לראות לידה. אני שוברת דברים, ואני עצבנית, ואני כועסת, והתסכול שאוכל אותי, למה לי זה קורה, למה לי זה מגיע. במשך כל השנים שלי הייתי מקבלת תגמול מיוחד שזה נקרא דגם, כמו מחוסר פרנסה. ויום אחד עצרו לי את זה ככה, בלי התראה, בלי שום דבר, הם החליטו שהם לא רוצים להביא לי עם כל מה שהרופאים ממליצים ועם כל ה... קשיים שלי וכל מה שיש לי, הם החליטו שלא בא להם. 
וצברנו חוב מחוב לחוב, לא עמדנו בתשלומים. שילמתי בערך ארבע חודשים משכנתה, ושלחו לי מכתב צו פינוי שאני מדברת שיש לי ניתוקים. אני לא יודע, אני חשבתי לסגור את הבית ולא לתת לאף אחד להיכנס, או שלעשות משהו טיפשי שעבר לי בראש, באמת. איך שהתקשרו אליי מהארגון ואמרו לי שעומדים לתרום לך, הרגשתי שאריאלה ממפעל הפיס מתקשרת אליי. לא האמנתי, התחלתי לרעוד, אני אמרתי, אני לא מתלוננת, כאילו, זה, זה, זה יותר מדי. מה, מה אני יכולה לעשות עם ארבעה ילדים בחוץ? זה היה בחורף, זה היה ימים לא רק שומים. כשקיבלנו תשובה מחזון לישראל, שהם ישלמו לנו את התשלומים האלה של המשכנתה, ירד לי ממש אבן כבדה מהלב, ממש ככה. הרגשתי משוחרר לגמרי. אני רוצה להגיד תודה רבה לחזון ישראל. אני אוהבת אתכם. תודה רבה על כל החסד שאתם עושים. זה לא ברור מאליו, זה משהו וואו. אני שמחה מאוד וגאה שיש אנשים כאלה במדינת ישראל. שמסייעים לאנשים שהם נפגעי טרור ונכי צה"ל ובכלל. תודה רבה, אני אוהבת אתכם. Love you. That was so touching and uh, moving. Um, Barry, I love their response at the end. Uh, so grateful that you could help pay their mortgage payments and help them uh, with obviously the great difficulty of not only financially dealing with what their uh, financial situation they had to deal with, but also uh, <coughs> those devastating flashbacks they would have got uh, of surviving a, a terror attack. And, um, you know, sadly, terrorism is, is nothing new in Israel, but the way that Israel has dealt with it It, the way that Israel has confronted that um, has been incredible to the extent now that the Israeli government is advising the French and British governments on counterterrorism and how to prevent ter Islamic terrorist attacks in our country and also on the continent of Europe. Um, but it's very difficult for those who have had loved ones murdered in awful acts of terrorism. Uh, can I just share a little bit of a story with you? Yes. Um, my first time in Israel was in uh, 1996. I, um, as part of my university course, I attended the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Um, three of the best months I, I have had in my life were spent in Israel. Um, learning Hebrew on an all pan, having trips around Israel and being with about 28 uh, American Jews and about four European Jews as well. So it, for me, it was a very, very special time. And when the course finished, We stayed in, in Jerusalem, and what was so interesting that when we're in Jerusalem, staying at um, the uh, Hebrew U, with the uh, Rosenberg School, uh, international school up there, my friends were staying there on campus. And one Saturday, I had a walk around uh, Jerusalem, which was, was fabulous, and then one time, the Lord told me to go down to the, uh, the Kota, the Western Wall, and I was like, I've been there this morning. I don't want to go again. And then all of a sudden, I lose my friends, so I said, okay, Lord, I'll, I'll, I'll be obedient now. I'll go down to the wall. And I remember going down to the wall. It was on the eve of Yom Kippur. So the Orthodox were out there with their, um, with their chauffeurs. Um, and then I looked around. I saw a huge police presence uh, with, with ambulances, with um, military um, soldiers all around. And the Lord just placed on my heart to pray against a terror attack. And after that, I started walking back through East Jerusalem up to, the, um, up to Mount Scopus. And it was then that I started crying because I thought, who could want to murder these people, these Jewish people? Uh, unbelievably special people. Um, and it just made absolutely no sense to me. Um, and, and so that's why I, I love what you're doing and reaching out to the victims of terrorism, uh, those who've been killed. I had a friend killed um, uh, back in 2002 at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem when I Palestinian terrorists put a bomb in the cafeteria. Uh, I remember uh, that. And, murder, and murdered her. Her name was, was Janice. She was part of our program. And, you know, it, it's something that all Israelis have to endure. But there's something so remarkable about the Israeli spirit that, that if, if, for example, the pizzeria place is blown up, they rebuild it. Um, and they said, the way we survive is we carry on living. What is it in the Israeli Jewish makeup 
that, uh, that makes Israelis say, look, we're dealing with this, this is horrible, but we move on and we're going to help the world even more. It's a very interesting, multi-perspective look at life and maybe the innate or genetic code of being Jewish, and I can't speak on behalf of all Jewish people, and certainly not everybody has the same view of how to respond, but um, I'll take you through a few different points that come to my heart as we're sharing. One is even in our work amongst thousands, not just hundreds, but thousands of victims of terror attacks and those who are suffering presently from PTSD, um, uh, trauma syndrome in the aftermath of terror attacks or rockets uh, hitting a town such as Stay Road on the southern border, uh, where 60% of the population is suffering from some form of PTSD symptoms. Um, we have learned through suffering how to also lend a hand and open our hearts to other nations and people who are experiencing that. And even I was communicating with somebody uh, related to the European Union that we're ready in Israel and my friends in government departments, we're ready to help uh, instruct and to train those in the European theater of the experience of uh, terrorism uh, and the aftermath of terror attacks, how we work with those in Israel if we can lend a hand and help others in other nations. Maybe that's part of the Jewish experience. You know, we look at the Holocaust where many Holocaust survivors um, in turn through their experiences and through the dark shadows of their past tragedies actually help comfort those in other nations. Um, and I think maybe through our own suffering, maybe it's an example of the way Yeshua was. Through his death and suffering on the cross he's, and his resurrection, there's life to people of all nations, ages, genders, and nationalities, and religious backgrounds anywhere. You know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. But beyond that also, at the work of Vision for Israel in the Joseph Storehouse, the victims of terror attacks are just one department of things we're doing. We're also helping reaching out to Holocaust survivors. Uh, we sponsor two different clubs of Holocaust survivors meeting, one in Hebrew, one in English. In fact, for the second night of Hanukkah in December of 2018, we not only uh, dedicated our third intensive care ambulance uh, because of our UK donors, uh, which is now serving up in the Golan Heights, uh, this ambulance, so if any of them are in tour groups and they see a yellow ambulance, more than likely they're going to see a sign that says celebrating 70 years of Israel, Vision for Israel in the Joseph Storehouse. But we've had over 8,000 emergency calls uh, come in concerning the ambulances and the metacycles that Vision for Israel and the Joseph Storehouse has sponsored. We also are providing school packs for children, especially foster uh, and orphan children or children who are from high-risk uh, domestic situations or under the poverty level. And um, we've now helped supply over 240,000 brand new, not used, but brand new school packs with school supplies in them to children throughout Israel, both Jews and Arabs to all segments of the society. There's no prejudice here. We, if there's a bona fide need amongst the Arab population, whether Christian or Muslim, or the Jewish population, whether religious or non-religious, or uh, believing or unbelieving, or the Druze or the Bedouin, we're there to help as God can provide us the means to do so. We're working with emergency and medical supplies. Uh, we're doing projects and holding events at the new Millennium Center in the heart of Israel. Um, there's just an unending list and, of course, to the general poor and needy population. Th so to answer that initial question, what is it that moves the heart of Jewish people? Maybe for me, anyhow, as a Jew, it's what Scripture says. And so we have two ways to look at it. We can look at it 
from the point of scripture where we see Job who suffered so much in Job chapter 29. I love this verse and Derek Prince loved this verse as well. Such a huge fan of Derek Prince. Yeah. Job 29 verse 11 and following says, when the ear heard, then it blessed me. And when the eye saw, then it approved me because I delivered the poor who cried out, the fatherless and the one who had no helper. The blessing of a perishing man came upon me and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. That's wonderful. Then it says, Job says, I put on righteousness and it clothed me. You know, as believers in scripture, we can put on righteousness where the word staka or charity comes from in the Hebrew language. My justice was like a robe and a turban. I was eyes to the lame. I was feet to the lame. I was a father to the poor and I searched out the case that I did not know. And I think that is something that is constantly driving us forward. Job was like the modern day social worker. I searched out the case that I did not know. What did Yeshua say, Jesus say, it's all in red letters when he talks, in Same. Matthew chapter 25, he says, when I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was naked, you clothed me. And when I was in prison, you came and visited me. When you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. These kinds of things drives us on. And finally, we read in the book of the epistle of Yaakov or James, true religion before God and the Father is this, to take care of the orphans and the widows in their time of need. So you ask me as a Jew or you ask me as a Jew who loves scripture or believes in Yeshua the Messiah, I tell you all these things make up my genetic code. And uh, that's what moves me and shakes me. And I think it's not just me. I think there's something amongst many Jewish people in the heart of Israel that's willing to help when push comes to shove. Because out of our own historical suffering, we're able to do that much more because we've understood our past, our present, and our future. Fabulous. Thank you. Uh, let's have a look now and see what uh, Vision for Israel is doing in helping lonely Holocaust survivors in Israel. אנחנו היינו גרים בדרום יוגוסלביה, זה נקרא קוסובו. כשבאו הגרמנים, הם באו לחפש את אבא שלי בגלל שהוא היה מוכר בעיר, ולא מצאו את אבא שלי, אז הלכו אצל יהודי אחר, והיה לו בן אחד, אז לקחו את הבן שלו ותלו אותו. אני הייתי לארץ ב-77, אמרו לי, אבא, תלכו מהר למרוקו, אין נאזים שם. היינו במרוקו, לקחו לנו שתי בנים, אחד עשרים ואחד, הרגו אותו, והשני חזר בלי עיניים. בן אדם שעובר בקושי, הוא תמיד גם יודע להתמודד ממנו יותר טוב ממי שלא יודע. זה דרך החיים. מוכרחים ללמוד כל דבר. וכשבאנו בארץ, קיבלו אותנו עם לחם לבן בריבה. זה היה כאילו העוגה הכי טובה. No one can erase the memory of the Holocaust. But together we can help its survivors live in comfort and dignity. It is our goal to provide financial aid, warmth and fellowship to Israel's Holocaust survivors. I have a radiator in my room, and also now it's <laughs> בגלל שכשאין לי מה לעשות, אני משחקת בברית שמה והכל במחשב. אני רוצה לנהנות ממה שיש לי, ומה שאני יודעת. מה שאני לא יודעת, כאילו הצעירים. אני עכשיו קיבלתי רדיאטור ושמיכה. תודה רבה. <laughs> ממש תודה. זה גם עזרה טובה. Let us show these dear men and women how much you love them by joining us 
in our mission to provide Israel's last Holocaust survivors with the security, support, and warmth that they so desperately need. And survivors of the Shoah are some of the most remarkable, amazing people we can ever meet. So, of course, after everything they've been through, uh, they need as much support as we can give them. Um, uh, Barry, you were saying, uh, as we were showing that excellent video that you produced, that uh, you could give up all your work and just spend time with these survivors and helping them. I, I feel that not only as a Jew, but for the sake of humanity, we owe a great a sense of responsibility to the survivors of the Holocaust to keep their memory alive, their story alive, and to never forget the evils of the Holocaust, which with the growth of anti-Semitism happening across Europe and elsewhere, uh, we must keep their memory alive. And the one thing I have to say is that um, as much aid, whether it's uh, heaters for the winter, blankets, uh, financial vouchers to help uh, them financially, uh, thousands of Holocaust survivors which we're working with, one thing I can tell you is this, that many of them who have lost a husband, a wife, their widows, widowers, um, or just on their own, they're lonely, and they just need somebody to come by and hug them and let them know that people still love them and care about them. And so we're working together with the government of Israel how to increase uh, the aid and the presence and the service we can provide uh, through our organization and many others like us as well. Fabulous. Now, you also produce an excellent TV program called uh, Roots and Reflection. That's right. Uh, which is very entertaining. And um, I, I can't believe we've gone through a whole program uh, without us talking about Israeli food and your love <laughs> for food. But no, it's a fabulous program. It's just on really Friday nights on Revelation TV. Same time as the Middle Same sort of like day as the Middle East Report. So if you right. watch the Middle East Report, make sure you watch Barry's program as well, uh, Roots and Reflection. Um, Barry, in summing up, um, how can our viewers um, get involved and help support the work of Joseph Storm? House and, and vision for Israel and get involved practically as well with standing with Israel and the Jewish people because you are you represent such a fabulous NGO really reaching out to all sections of Israeli society and community and and bringing Christians around the world to stand with Israel. Well, first of all, I encourage everybody to go to our website, visionforisrael.com, which they can see on the screen. It's visionforisrael.com, and in the upper right hand of the corner of the website is also a site for the UK, which is specially designed for those wonderful residents of the United Kingdom. And then, of course, um, they can go to our Facebook page, which is Vision for Israel. And they can, for those in the UK, can call our office in Swindon, 01793-279-111. Again, that's 01793-279-111. Talk to our staff. But I want to encourage any and all people that are coming to Israel, come visit us at our new Millennium Center, which houses the work of the humanitarian aid of Vision for Israel in the Joseph Storehouse. And you can write us at info at visionforisrael.com, and we will answer the email. That's info at visionforisrael.com. And uh, your conferences is a superb. Uh, you've Thank invited you. him the last couple of years to be a speaker and it's been a great honour to actually speak at uh, one of your events, Barry. But before we go, um, do you have a, a message for our viewers? Uh, maybe someone's watching who don't, doesn't know the, the life-giving power of Yeshua HaMashiach and how important it is to have our sins forgiven and have a, a new life in him. Yes, I really think that it's so critical and the days are so uh, moving so fast forward that I want to invite all people that are watching this program and especially uh, the family of the Jewish community that uh, my faith in Yeshua, a Jewish Messiah, created within me the desire to do that much more for my people but also for the community in this earth and world today. That I believe it's not all about uh, a, a spiritual kind of, uh, you know, thinking of the he hereafter, but it's also what we do now. So I want to express to all of you that when you connect with a Jewish Messiah 
whom we call Yeshua in Hebrew or Jesus in English, that you're connecting with a lifelong eternal presence of God in your lives. There is a hereafter. And I want to say to all of you that if you don't know him today, now is the day of salvation. Barry, I just want to thank you so much for being my guest on today's uh, Middle East Report. Thank you so much for sharing your incredible and powerful testimony. Thank you. And uh, Kola Kavod for the excellent work you do with uh, Joseph Storehouse and the Vision for Israel. And uh, I pray that you would have a fantastic uh, 25th anniversary in uh, 2019. Thank you. Pleasure. And uh, I just want to thank you all for watching today's uh, Middle East Report. Um, we can all get involved and support Israel. And what a wonderful way to stand with Israel and the Jewish people by supporting Joseph Storehouse. Uh, so please get involved, um, check out their ministry and uh, support the work they're doing. And we'll leave you with this inspirational song sung by Barry and uh, Batia themselves, uh, Through the Gates. i